It was at the International Youth Triennium in Bloomington, Indiana in July of 1980 that Professor Bruce Riggins of McCormick Theological Seminary was sharing with 3,800 attendees that he had been a very dedicated Christian working in an amazing way with the underprivileged in London, England. He wanted to know what inspired her Christian faith and action, so she shared her story of how seeing another Christian's faith converted her. She was a Jew fleeing the German Gestapo in France during World War II. She knew she was close to being caught and wanted to give up. She came to the home of a French Huguenot. A widow lady came to the home to say that it was time to find a new place. This Jewish lady came to that home and she said, it's no use. They will find me anyway. They are so close behind me. But the Christian widow said, yes, they will find someone here, but it's time for you to leave. Go with these people to safety. I will take your identification and wait here. The Jewish lady then understood the plan. The Gestapo would come and they would find this Christian widow and think that she was the fleeing Jew. As Professor Riggins listened to the story, the Christian lady of Jewish descent looked him in the eye and said, I asked her why she was doing that. And the widow responded, it's the least I can do. Christ has already done that and more for me. The widow was caught and imprisoned in the Jewish lady's place, allowing time for her to escape. Within six months, the Christian widow was dead in the concentration camp. This Jewish lady never forgot that. She too became a follower of Jesus Christ and lived her life serving others. She met God through the greatest love a person can give. Personal self-sacrifice. In faith, an authentic Christian lives his life serving others. Saying, that's the least I can do, considering what great sacrifices Christ has already made for me. The title of our sermon this week as we continue our journey of redeemed through the cross is entitled Paid in Full. And this morning that is what we will look at in our scripture. If you'll please stand with me and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, we shall begin in the 28th verse. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells you the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look 
on the one they have pierced. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for its truth, for the story of life that we find contained within. Father, may we read, understand, and apply it to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. First, we look at Scripture fulfilled. Observe how much respect Christ showed to the Scripture. Verse 28 says, Knowing that all things were accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, he spoke and said, I thirst. In his sufferings, he called for a drink. Now, did he really need this drink? No. But he said it so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now, it wasn't strange for Jesus to be thirsty. We find him thirsty in the beginning of his journey. And now we find him thirsty at the end of his journey. What's represented in what Jesus calls out when he says... I'm thirsty. Could it be that he is calling out the torments of hell that are represented by a violent thirst and the complaint of the rich man that begged for a drop of water to cool his tongue? To that never ending thirst that we would have been condemned had Christ not suffered for us. But the true meaning and reason for his complaining of his thirst is actually somewhat surprising. It is the only word he spoke that looked like a complaint of his outward sufferings. When they scourged him and when they crowned him with thorns, when they flogged him and whipped him, when they placed a rugged cross on his Open back. He not he never cried out. He never said, Oh my head, oh my back. But here he says, I am thirsty. He thirsted after the glorifying of God. And the accomplishment of the work of our redemption. That is what he thirsted after. He would make sure to see that scripture was fulfilled completely. Leaving no room for someone else to come in and say, well, he fulfilled everything except this one. There's no room for doubt. There's no room to say, well, he did it all except for this, so he must not have truly been the Messiah. But now, all had been accomplished, and he knew it. For this was the thing he had carefully observed all along. And now he called to mind one more thing, and that... In all that he did went exactly according to the word of God, taking care not to destroy, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. And so the scripture had foretold of his thirst, and therefore he himself said it out loud because it could have not been known otherwise without him saying, I thirst. Think back to Samson. He is what we tall, call a type of Christ. When he was slaying the Philistines, heaps upon heaps of them, he himself was very thirsty. And so was Christ when he was upon the cross, spoiling the principalities and the powers of this world. 
just as Samson was spoiling the principalities and the powers of the Philistines. Amen. Secondly, the scripture had foretold that in his thirst he should have vinegar given him to drink. They had given him vinegar to drink before they crucified him. But the prophecy was not exactly fulfilled in that moment. Because that was not in his thirst. And so now he called out, I thirst. Back then, in, at the beginning, when he, they gave him the vinegar water, the vinegar wine to drink, he would not. But now he received it. And Christ would rather take the disrespect and the humiliation than see any prophecy go unfulfilled. I just saw this week. And of course, we can't know exactly what they used. We understand it was a sponge and the hyssop branch, and it was lifted to his lips. But I also saw this week in a short video that that same sponge and the same hyssop branch wasn't just used for giving vinegar wine to those whom they crucified. What they would actually do is that the Romans were very far advanced in hygiene technology and in sewage technology. They would have open bathhouses where you would go and you would do your business. And also there, in order to clean the rear end, they would have a sponge tied to a hyssop branch. And in front of them would be a flowing trough of vinegar water. And they would dip that sponge in the vinegar water which, as we know, is a disinfectant. And that is what they would use to clean themselves after they were done. And so it is very possible that that is what that sponge and hyssop branch that was lifted to the lips of our Savior had been used for by the Roman soldiers as they waited for him to die while they were also taking care of other business. So it could be that that same hyssop branch that was being dipped into the vinegar wine had remnants of fecal matter and then lifted to the lips of our Savior. Christ was willing to even go through that so that scripture would be fulfilled. The disrespect and the humiliation, Christ saw it worth it for you and for me. And so this should satisfy us under all of our trials that the will of God is done. And the word of God is accomplished in Jesus. And so we come to it is finished. With these three words, Jesus declared the completion of our salvation. Nothing else is needed. It is done. For centuries, people have attempted to get to God and to heaven through their own way. Some try religion. Some put their hope in a system or in practices, in habits and traditions. Others explore the world's philosophies, holding up the thoughts of people over and above the word of God. But today, most of our idols are not wooden or stone. They are ideas, beliefs. And opinions that are against the knowledge of God. And they are by people who are far from him. We will search the world over. To find.
find something that makes us feel good about ourselves. Something that tells us that we're not truly as bad as we think we are. Something that tells us that, well, if you just do enough, which you are doing enough is what they will tell you, then everything will work out fine. Because they cannot come to grips with the fact that they, too, are guilty sinners who have sinned against an almighty and sovereign God. And so they make up things to make themselves feel good. And so we get the motto or the mantra, if it feels good, it is good. If it brings you joy, then it's okay. If it makes you happy, even for just a few moments, then that's what you should pursue and to do. And living by these ways of thinking is idolatry. We don't have to have a graven image in order for it to be idolatry. You can idolize anything, anyone, any idea, and it still be idolatry. Other people trust their own morality to get them to heaven, expecting their good deeds or motives to earn them eternal security. If you go and you go to a convention of religions, and all of the religions are there and they have their booths set up and they're trying to tell you why you should choose them over another, if you were to go to every single one of those booths and ask them, who pays for my sin? Who pays for my wrongdoing? None of them will have an answer except Christianity. There is no one else who has ever taken your place, who has ever taken your guilt, your shame, your unrighteousness upon themselves so that you could live except for Christ. None of these attempts can earn God's forgiveness. God's holiness demanded a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And so Jesus Christ came as a substitute for you and for me, and God placed on him our sin, and he became sin for us. His death on the cross means that nothing else is due. Jesus' death on the cross was not a down payment. It was the full payment. Amen. You can have the certificate paid in full. Amen. The lien on your life has been released. No one has ownership of you anymore. No one has claim over you anymore except for him who died on the cross for your life. Because he placed himself in your stead. Amen. And he cried out, it is finished. Nothing more to be done. Nothing more had to be done. He had fulfilled and completed the prophecy. He had fulfilled the will of God. He had fulfilled his purpose for coming to earth. He is the only one. 
fulfill all of the prophecy of the Messiah. And he chose you and me. Amen. Even over and above himself. Just as in the story we heard a few minutes ago of a Christian widow standing in the place of a young Jewish woman, even to the point of going willingly to a concentration camp, knowing that she would most likely die, and she did, just so that she might save one. All because it's the least that I can do, considering what a great sacrifice Christ has made for me. So is there something else that you're trusting in today? Is there someone else that you have placed your hope in today? Is there an ideology, a political figure, a government, anything that you have placed your trust and hope in today except for Jesus? If so, run to the Lord. Put your full confidence in him to save you, for he is the only one who can. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Will you partake? Will you claim yours? By repenting of your sins and placing your trust in him. The one who paid it in the one who made such a great sacrifice for you and for me. Shall we stand for a closing hymn? this morning because you truly paid it all. We thank you, Jesus, that you went on the cross for us, for my life, for my sins, so that I could have the opportunity to be in communion and in life with the Father. So, Lord, may we live in that hope knowing that you did pay it all knowing that in the day in which you return 
we shall be there with you. Forever singing praises to the Father. Because of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Lord, go with us. May we carry this story of truth and of hope and of life to all those whom we come into contact with. That knowing that they too have an opportunity to claim the sacrifice of Jesus. To repent of their sins and trust in the Lord. Father, go with us. Equip us, enable us, give us wisdom and courage and knowledge to speak forth your truth, your hope, and your life to all who are in need. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen.